and right decisions. And you have to protect yourself from mental overload, from emotional overload. It's your responsibility to protect yourself because if you go down, your family may go down. Especially for us as adults. Uh, the precipitating factor is the straw that broke the camel's back. Some people seem to hold together very well during a time of extreme loss or heartache and then fall apart over a broken dish or a dropped glass. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, I have too. You know. um, and these, these apparently minor events are the last straw and the reaction that tears um, that uh, are in response, reaction and tears are in response to the serious loss. In other words, you know, it's like they're able to, to hold themselves together uh, not realizing that they're just one little small fraction from breaking. And then we have what's called uh, the state of active crisis. And this is when a person can no longer handle the situation. The active crisis develops. And the following four indications of the state. We have symptoms of stress, an attitude of panic or defeat, a focus of relief, and then a time of lowered efficiency. The symptoms of stress are psychological um, I mean, yeah, psychological, physiological, or both. And these could include depression, headaches, anxiety, bleeding ulcers, and so forth. Some type of extreme discomfort is usually present. An attitude of panic or defeat, uh, these people may feel that they have tried everything and nothing works. Uh, therefore, they feel like failures, defeat, overwhelmed, and helpless, and there's no hope. They have two ways of responding at this time. They either become agitated with behavior that is unproductive, like pacing or, or uh, uh, drinking or taking drugs, fast driving, getting into a fight, uh, whatever they can do to get their adrenaline pumping or something like that to try to compensate for what they're struggling with, or becoming apathetic, um, which means you know, just the opposite, basically. They sleep all the time. They sort of like shut themselves in. And then thirdly, we have a focus on relief. And this is the get me out of this situation type uh, <clears throat> uh, response. And it's the concern and cry type. Their feelings are similar to the psalmist who said, Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. I, hide, I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until this violent storm is passed. They want relief from the pain of stress, and they're not in a condition to deal with their problem in a rational way. Sometimes people in crisis may appear to be in a daze or even respond in bizarre ways. They're somewhat frantic in their efforts and will look to others for help. They may become overly dependent upon others to help them out in their dilemma. Um, I remember there was an individual that attended church with us many, many years ago. And that individual, I can't say for how many months, it might have even been years, I can't remember, but that individual cried every service. Some of you will remember who I'm talking about. Bless their heart. And that individual cried every service, through every service. Um, and uh, seemed like it went on for years, but actually I wasn't here but a year and a half, so it couldn't went on any longer than that So, uh, in this building. But anyway, uh, precious person. And, uh, you know, uh, basically, none, I guess none of us had the understanding that hopefully we do now and didn't realize it. But now I stop and think about it and their life and the things they've been through. And what was wrong was they were grieving. And I realize it now. I realize what was going on now. They were in a, a, a traumatic state of grief. But they didn't realize it. And we didn't realize it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, a time of lowered efficiency. People in active crisis may continue to function normally, but instead of responding at 100%, their response may be about 60%. <clears throat> okay? So, to throw in some balancing factors here, most people experiencing a crisis perceive the loss of threat and loss of something that is important to them. Even a job promotion can bring a sense of loss that uh, precipitates a crisis. Some people feel that a problem will not lead to a crisis unless there are deficiencies in one or more of the balancing factors of a person's life. Uh, adequate perception. This is the way people, uh, a problem is viewed and the meaning it has for the person. So balancing perceptions. Adequate network. This involves having a group of friends, relatives, or agencies that provide support during a problem. The body of Christ, which you know, comprised of the church, uh, has the potential of being one of the greatest support groups ever available if the members know how to respond to the person in need. 
coping mechanisms. Most of us learn this balancing factor. If these mechanisms don't function well or break well, function well or break down, it, a crisis can be experienced. The mechanisms involve rationalization, denial, new knowledge, prayer, reading, scripture, and so on. The greater the number and diversity of coping methods, the less likely a person will experience a crisis. And then, of course, limited duration. People cannot exist in a crisis state for an extended period of time. Something's got to be done. Uh, they have to come to resolution. And experience and research show that a crisis ends and balance is restored within a maximum of six weeks. This means that help needs to be available during this time frame, or the person may lose solution, solutions that are detrimental or counter, may choose solutions that are detrimental or counterproductive. What happens is they come to the point where they feel pressured to do something, to, to, to react in some way, to bring resolve. And usually, it, usually they're going to make a decision, and it may not be a positive or a healthy decision that they end up making. So life's transitions, not all crises are unexpected. Another type of crisis is the predictable event. It's an event that is part of the planned, expected, normal process of life, and it leads to a crisis. And life is full of these kind of transitions. It's a period of moving from one state of certainty to another with an interval of uncertainty and changes in between. It's like traveling from one island to another. We leave solid ground, and in order to get to the next place or next level of solid ground, there's that vulnerable place in between. And the Bible sees all of life, actually, as being like that. Hebrews 11, 8 says, By faith, uh, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Many transitions occur throughout life that have the potential of becoming crises. The transition from being single to married, from being 20 to 30, from being 30 to 40, from being uh, color hair to gray hair. <laughs> In other words, we go through all kinds of transitions. And every one of them require faith, and they require trust in God, but they also bring with them um, some, some level of trauma or at least some crisis comes with it because there's change. It also produces new roles that causes us to uh, deal, have to deal with ourselves in a new way and have to deal with others in a new way. Um, you know, um, for me, there was a day when I stood here in this sanctuary as a, as a young, very young man and, uh, and, and as a, a young father and a young husband. Today I stand here as a grandpa. You know, uh, and I, I relate to people totally different, and, and, I, and I have to accept that. I have to accept the fact that in my age, uh, a lot of things are different now. And so that's called life, but that's part of it. Geographical changes. In our society today, people move on the average of three, every three years. People relocate and move. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to move across the world every three years. You may just move down the street, but people relocate frequently, and, and, and that's the national average, about every three years. So if you didn't move within the last three years, you're not part of that average, but actually you're part of it, but you, you make up the less moving percentage of it. Yeah. Um, socioeconomic changes, uh, horrendous things have happened in the last five years to our economic uh, financial realm in our country and from what they're saying it's going to be uh, uncertain for some time we just don't know what's coming physical changes um, you know I don't know about all of y'all but hearing changes sight changes um, hair falls out <laughs> hair grows in places you don't want it to grow <laughs> there are a lot of things that happen that just happen, amen, midlife crisis you know what's funny about midlife crisis is that we have them in western countries but they don't have them in eastern countries um, that, that's very interesting uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of like the dating type situation teenagers in other countries don't grow up and no, they don't know anything about adolescence they don't know what uh, being a teenager is all about they don't have problems with adolescence in some countries that we have in our country, you know, over here, the teenager thing, oh, when you get teenagers, you just better hold on as a parent. They don't have those kind of cliches in other countries. Their teenagers don't rebel. They don't have the 
the concept because their whole approach to child rearing and dealing with them and their expectations for their teenagers is totally different. Uh, when you reach 12 years old, you move into adulthood. You don't move into adolescence. And kids don't grow up being told when you get 13 you're going to have brain damage, you know. But that's what we teach our children. We program our children to go crazy for 10 years, you know, from 12 to 22 or what have you. And so what do they do? They go crazy in their teen years. It's totally different in other countries. Um, we have trouble educating our children because in America, um, we approach it totally different than they do in other countries. In other countries, kids are focused. They study. They apply themselves. In America, we man the truckloads of Ritalin and all kinds of stuff like that that have to be uh, you know, distributed just to get a kid to sit still in the seat. In other countries, they don't have that problem. Uh, why is this? And I'm talking about Asian countries. I'm not talking about England. They, they're as messed up as we are. And, and you know what I'm saying? In Western, all, all Western countries, it, all countries that think like we do, same problems. Um, and yet we still think we got it together. But this midlife crisis thing is very interesting. A lot of, a lot of uh, Asian and, and Eastern countries don't have this common problem here with people uh, weirding out at midlife crisis. And it's because they approach things differently. In our country, we have this approach. We, we raise our young people and we tell them this. When you get 18, you go to college and you get a career that will make you lots of money. We don't teach our children what they teach them in other countries. They, in other countries, they teach their Christian children and non-Christian children. You go and you get a career that you are called to. You, you, you find out what God or Buddha... Of course, we don't believe Buddha is telling them anything, but they emphasize you find out what is your place in society. What are you going to love? What are you going to enjoy? What do you want to dedicate your life to? And then you go study and prepare for that. In America, it don't matter what you like. You go get you a degree in what's going to pay the most. How smart are you? We hope you're smart enough to be an engineer or a doctor. Because they make the most money. This is what we tell our poor kids in America. Now, you go to college, but you're going to college because you're going to make lots of money. We don't tell our kids, be a holy man, be a good person, contribute to society. We tell them, go and serve yourself. Hello? That's what we tell them. And so here's what happens. All these kids, against everything in them that's crying out, you have a calling. You have a purpose in life. You're going to be great at something special that God's designed you for and put in your DNA. They go contrary to that because society and their own parents are telling them, serve yourself. Serve the God of mammon. Hello. So they go off to college and they get a degree in something they're not even interested in. Sometimes they hate. And they, they suffer through 4 to 12 to 15 years of college and training or tech school or whatever. And they go off in a career they hate. It makes them horrible to be around when they come home because they're miserable all day. It makes them, it makes them, uh, it makes them be, serve the God of money. All the, the only pleasure they find is, is in getting that check and, 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 and spending it and consuming it upon their lust. They have marital problems. They're, they don't raise their kids right because everything that they've set their focus on has been upon what they were told to. Is anybody following what I'm saying? At about 40 years old, they hit the stage that we've already told them, you know, when you get 40 years old, you're going to go through this emotional instability, and I hope you can hold it together. Most people, most people lose it during that time. And sure enough, by the time they get 40, they are sick of living a life that's all made up and false. Because it ain't them. It's not who they wanted to be. It's not, they're not doing what they wanted. They've determined by the time they're 40, they've wasted their life doing something they don't like, doing something they're not interested in. They don't care. They've realized by this time that money don't make me happy. And a lot of them have been able to buy anything they want. They've been able to do anything they want, go anywhere they want, and they're not satisfied. And they reach 40 years old, and they go crazy. And they run off with a 20-year-old French girl or something, who don't care nothing about them. How you follow what I'm saying? Except for their money. The only problem is, is she don't know, but he just quit his job too. <laughs> Hello. And what do we call it in America? Normal. 
he's in a midlife crisis. Ah, he's just a product of our messed up society is what he is. And it's going to take a half a dozen psychologists and an altar somewhere to even get him to be able to live the next 20 or 30 years because his brain's so messed up. His family's going to be destroyed. His children are going to be warped and twisted now because their, their lives are broken and messed up. And you know what? Here's the problem. If he does get straightened out enough to be able to live a somewhat normal life, he's going to leave there and go back and tell his kids to do the same thing he just did that screwed his life up. He's going to say, now don't make the mistakes I did, but get you a good college degree and make lots of money and you'll be happy. He'll tell them the very same thing because we don't get it. Listen to me. You don't find happiness unless you do what God has put you on earth to do. And money may help solve problems, but it won't make you happy. Hello? I'm sorry, did I preach? Um, let me talk here just briefly about people, types of people. Uh, there are some types of people that, that you will uh, seek out for counseling, or basically that seek you out for counseling. Um, and there are 14 different categories that represent the wide variety of these types of counselees who need crisis intervention. Uh, first of all, there are counselees who want a strong person to protect and control them. Um, and they're basically saying, please take over for me. You'll, you'll find some people like that. They're, they're basically looking for someone to run their life. Then you'll find those who need someone that will help them maintain contact with reality. And they're saying, help me know that I am real. In other words, they feel like they are totally disconnected with the world. Then there are those who feel exceedingly empty and who need loving. And they're saying to you, care for me. You'll find those who need a counselor to be available for a feeling of security. And they're saying, always be there. Then you have those ridden with obsessive guilt who seek to confess. And what they're really saying is, take away my guilt. You'll have those who urgently need to talk things out. And they're saying, let me get it off my chest. Then there'll be those who desire advice on pressuring issues. And they're going to say, uh, you know, tell me what to do. Help me make this decision. You're going to have those who seek out <clears throat> to sort out their conflicting ideas. And they're saying to you, help me to put things into perspective. Then there'll be those who truly have a desire for self-understanding and insight into their problems. And they're, and they're saying to you, I want counseling. Then there'll be some of those who uh, see their discomfort as a medical problem and that needs uh, the ministrations of a physician. And they're saying to you, I need a doctor. And then there'll be those who seek some practical help, such as economic assistance or a place to stay. And they're just simply saying, I need some specific assistance. Then there are those who credit their difficulty to ongoing current relationships, and they want the counselor to intercede. They're, they're saying to you, would you do this for me? And then there are those who want information about where to get help to satisfy various needs. They're actually seeking some community resource, so they're coming to ask you to tell them where to get what they need. And then you have the unmotivated or the psychotic person who come or who are brought to the counselor against their own will. And they're really saying, I don't want anything. You know, you'll have some people that the court system will say, you know, you, you need to get counseling and, you know, you get counseling or you're going to jail. Something like that. And uh, fortunately, all of these people, through good counseling, sometimes can be brought to the Lord and they can be helped. But... Uh, depending on their reasoning, sometimes it's more difficult to help some than it is others. And then people who cope poorly are the various people who seek your help. Some will cope quite well in, with their crises and others will not do so well. Uh, and it's, it's possible to predict which will um, be which. Emotional weakness. Individuals who are emotionally weak prior to the crisis respond in a way that makes matters worse. But from their perspective, they are doing the most efficient thing possible. Uh, it's like I heard somebody say that, uh, that their, their pastor would always say, you know, when, when someone like this would get into a situation, well, they're doing the best they can. And a lot of times that is true. Uh, sometimes you'll just have people who basically they were just getting by before this happened. And they may be not handling or coping good at all, 
but they're doing the best they can. And you just, you're just going to have to meet them where they are and help them. Then you have people in poor, poor physical condition. And those are, those are who have some type of physical ailment or illness. And they have fewer resources to draw on during a crisis. Then you have the denial of reality. That's those who deny reality um, have a hard time coping with a crisis. Denying reality is their attempt to avoid pain and anger. And they uh, may deny that they are seriously ill or financially ruined or that their children are on drugs or terminally ill. It, and this, this can include anybody. It doesn't matter how smart they are. Uh, they can be professionals or anybody else. Everybody can fall to this and be involved in this. Then there's the magic of the mouth. <laughs> Har uh, Harvard psychiatrist Ralph Hershowitz has created a term for the fourth characteristic. He calls the magic of the mouth. And this is the tendency to eat, drink, smoke, and talk excessively. When difficulty enters these people's lives, they seem to regress to infantile forms of behavior, and their mouth takes over in one way or another. They are uncomfortable unless they're doing something with their mouth most of the time. This attempt, the, uh, this attempt to not face the real problem can continue after the crisis is over. The person is actually creating an additional crisis for himself or herself. It's really kind of like an addiction is what it is. Um, they, and, and actually it's very common. You, you'll see these people, it's like they're, they just become motor mouth. And, I, and, and their mouth is usually full of excuses and explanations and reasons. You know, why the problem is this way and why it's that way. Or, or they'll smoke like, like a freight chain, train. You know, just smoke, smoke, smoke. You know, or they'll start drinking or something like that. Uh, unrealistic approach to time. People who use this coping mechanism crowd the time dispensation or di dimensions, actually, of a problem. Or they extend uh, the time factors far into the future. In other words, they want the problem to be fixed right away. Or else they delay and delay. Delaying avoids the discomfort of reality, but enlarges the problem. Excessive guilt. These people tend to blame themselves for the difficulty by feeling worse. They immobilize themselves even more. And then we have blame. These individuals do not focus on what the problem is, but instead turn to who they believe caused the problem. The approach is to find some enemies, either real or imagined, and project the blame on them. Um, this, this can be common. And people who get involved in this sometimes... Um, can really be, cause problems and really be an issue to excessive dependence or independence. Um, these people will either turn away offers of help or become clinging vines. Um, those who cling tend to suffocate you if you're involved in helping them. Over de overly dependent people, on the other hand, shun offers of help. Even if they are sliding down the hill toward disaster, they, they don't cry out for assistance. And then when disaster hits, they either continue to deny it or blame it on others. And then finally, theology. Uh, a person's theology will affect how he or she copes with a crisis. Our lives are based on our theology. Yet so many people are frightened by, by that word. Our belief in God and how we perceive God is a reflection of our theology. Those who believe in the sovereignty and caring nature of God have a better basis from which to approach life. Uh, Dr. Floyd offered the following observations about crisis from a Christian perspective. He says that, uh, number one, being a Christian doesn't exempt a person from all crises. Number two, a crisis to humans is not a crisis to God. And number three, God comforts and promises to be present. Um, number four, a crisis will not last forever. Number five, hope is resident in crisis. Um, so... Uh, that's, uh, that's powerful. Amen. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, But we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character. And proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Chuck Swindoll always talks uh, so realistically and hopefully about life's crises. He says, Crisis crushes. And in crushing, it often refines and purifies. You may be discouraged today because the crushing has not yet led to a surrender. I have stood beside too many of the dying, ministered to too many of the broken and bruised to believe that crushing is an end in itself. Unfortunately, however, it usually takes the brutal blows of affliction to soften and penetrate hard hearts, even though such blows are often unfair. Another crisis crushes 
God, uh, after crisis crushes, God steps in to comfort and teach. Um, Psalms 34, 17, and 18 says, The Lord hears His people. When they call to Him for help, He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. There are some phases uh, to a crisis. Sometimes uh, models of grief are used to describe crisis stages and stages such as shock, denial, disorganization, and reorganization. We actually even looked at that earlier today. Um, the Phoenix Phenomenon uh, by Joanne Jozefowski uh, identifies five phases of grief, and those are impact, chaos, adaptation, equilibrium, and transformation. The impact phase is the first phase of a crisis uh, and uh, it's usually very brief. You know immediately that you've been confronted with a major happening. And for some people, it's like being hit with a two-by-four. Uh, it's like being knocked upside the head almost. It's becoming aware of the crisis and experiencing the effect of, of just like a st being stunned. This lasts for a few hours to a few days, depending on the event and the person who's involved. In a severe loss, uh, tears can occur immediately or it can be a few days later. The more severe the crisis or the loss, the greater the impact and the greater the amount of incapacitation and numbness. During this thinking, or during this stage, our thinking capability is lessened. Then there's the lost object. During the impact phase, a person actually symbolically searches for the lost object. His or her thought process is directed toward the loss. For example, it's common for a person who loses a loved one in death to take out photographs and other items that remind him or her of the person who died. When something that means a great deal to us is lost, we hold on to our emotional attachments. Uh, and then emotional guilt. Guilt often accompanies crisis. People who experience guilt have several choices available to them to alleviate the guilt. They rationalize their way out of the guilt. They can, protect, they, they can project blame onto others. They can attempt to pay penance and work off the guilt. Or they can apply the forgiveness available when there has been genuine sin and violation of God's principle. Uh, the withdrawal and confusion phase is the next one. And uh, this uh, is about emotional turmoil. One of the key factors in this phase is that turmoil in the emotional area. With some counselees, you'll see something like a cauldron churning with one emotional expression after another. The emotions are on the surface. Um, there are some who are so numb during the initial phase that they're unaware of the cauldron of feelings. The individual feels as if they've died, but the feelings have not. During the second phase, some who have already experienced their feelings may feel worn out emotionally or depressed. And there are about nine disruptions that signal a person's inability to cope in his or her usual way. There's a sense of bewilderness. There's a sense of danger. There's a sense of confusion. There's a sense of impasse of desperation, of apathy, of helplessness, urgency, and discomfort. So when you know these emotions, uh, you'll assist. Uh, this can assist you in helping to re in relating to the person. And you can actually ask questions and statements. Some examples that you might ask would be, could it be that you just think, you just can't think clearly, like your mind isn't working? Or could it be that you feel stuck, like nothing that you do seems to help? So some of these questions like this will help bring them forward in this situation. Um, go to organization. One of the best ways to aid people during this phase is to give them some help organizing their lives. They need assistance in arranging appointments, keeping the house in order, and other such uh, routine responsibilities. They need help because they may be suffering from some type of a emotional paralysis of the will. Um, Self-pity is another tendency in this phase. It's not uncommon for people to appear confused, and this may be e evident because they uh, will begin some task or start to approach people and then retreat. Um, so people will deal with self-pity in some, some sense of the manner like that. Um, let me see where we're... Um, let me, let me just cover a few points here and then we'll wrap it up for today, okay? Remember, crisis counseling is not a therapy. It's a skillful intervention and it follows a definite format. 
This is why professional counselors and ministers and trained lay people can all be effective in helping others at a time of crisis. During phase one, as well as two, the following two guidelines will help the person in a crisis. As you ask questions and make statements, keep them short and concise. Only one question at a time with open-ended questions are best unless you need specific factual information. Ask them to describe their memories of what happened, such as where they were, what they saw, smelled, felt, heard, and above all, let them tell their story. Be sure to tend to any stress, pressure, or tension in your life prior to attempting to help the situation. Being calm can provide stability. Be sure in a calm, quiet way that you provide structure, set limits, and guide the outcome. Sometimes using rep repetitive questions or statements when a person strays can help. Um, and so um, that's uh, probably where we'll stop right there. Okay? Uh, I encourage you to read the rest of this study guide because um, it deals a little bit more with some, some good information. And then towards the back, further towards the back, which we didn't get to, it deals with suicide. And you, you definitely want to look at that. Okay? Thank you, guys.